everyone. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Welcome back to Matan's One on One Parsha podcast, where we spend about 30 minutes discussing deep thematic points about the Parsha. Our series on Tvarim is titled Dor Hem Sheikh Messages for a Lifetime. Each episode explores Moshe's educational message for the Jewish people as they prepare to enter the land of Israel. Each week's guest will be someone who herself has learned at Matan and is now passing these educational messages on to the next generation of Torah students. If you'd like to sponsor a podcast episode in honor or memory of a loved one, please contact the Matan office by telephone or email us at podcast at matan.org.il. These sponsorships enable us to keep creating new content. So if you deliberated until now, don't hesitate to be in touch. In this week's Parsha, V'et Hanan, Moshe continues his historical introduction as well as begins the main speech of the Book of Dvarim. Moshe tells the people how he begged to be allowed into the land, but was told no by God, and to appoint Yoshua. Moshe implores the people to follow the word of God, neither adding nor subtracting from it. He notes that they have seen with their own eyes what happens to people that don't follow the way of God. He warns of a time when Jews will sin and be exiled, but he also encourages the people that there will always be a way back. Moshe reminds the people of the covenant at Mount Sinai and that this was a breach, not just between God and their fathers, but between God and them as well. Our Parsha also contains the familiar passage of Shema, which declares God's oneness and the reciprocal positive nature of the relationship between God and the generations. Today my guest is Dr. Adina Sternberg, a lecturer at Matan. She was part of the first cohort of Matan Kitzvuni Fellowship, which was created to promote the publication of high-level Torah scholarship by women. The initiative provides female Torah scholars with the support necessary to facilitate their ability to complete a book of Torah scholarship. Adina is writing a book called From Ohel Moed to Yemei Moed, which discusses the various dimensions of the holidays and how they are imported into a modern observance of them. She also studied in the Hilchata program and lectures in the Afrata College and the Midrasha at Bar Ilan University. Adina, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you. And good luck, Rivi. One of the things that's really interesting about our Parsha is that it contains these two elements. We're still in an introduction, and yet we're also getting to the point where Moshe is really getting to the meat of his speech. And there's a lot of warning. There's a lot of Moshe telling the people not just what they need to do, but also preparing them for the fact that they might fall. And I think one of the most interesting pieces of advice or warnings that Moshe gives the people is not adding or taking away from the mitzvot. He tells them to keep the mitzvot, which makes sense. But this idea of not structuring the mitzvot in a different way than they were given, I think needs some exploring. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on it are. Okay. Actually, the parsha is a little bit confusing because it kind of takes two of Moshe's speeches and takes the end of the first one and the beginning of the second one. So it kind of is a little bit confusing in terms of its structure. But we start the parsha with the end of Moshe's first speech, where he's, the main thing I think that he's trying to tell the people is you don't have to worry about entering the land of Israel. It's going to be okay. We know you're afraid. We know the spies were afraid. But there's only one thing you need to know. If you keep the word of God and you listen to God, you will inherit the land. When God didn't want people to inherit the land, they didn't. And when God wanted them to, they did. All you need to do is fulfill the mitzvot. And that's the first main message that Moshe is trying to tell the people. You don't need to worry because it doesn't have to do with how big the people of the land are. It has to do with how big a people you are and if you're doing the things correct. And we'll get back to that in just a second. Afterwards, we have this sort of pause when Moshe finishes one speech and goes on to the next speech. And in the middle, what the Torah has to tell us, which is one of the very few stories in the book of Dvarim, is that Moshe goes and puts aside three Aramiklat, three cities of refuge. Like he's trying to tell them, the land of Israel, you come and you keep mitzvot. And I didn't get to go into the land of Israel, but I can already start doing some of these mitzvot. And once I can, I will. I'll do what I can immediately, right away, and then I'll prepare you for the rest of the mitzvot when you actually enter the land of Israel. 
But I think it's beautiful that he's showing them, he's setting the bar, he's showing them what we call dukmaishit, right? He's showing them how to do the things on his own. And then he'll continue and say, okay, I have more expectations, come and listen what these mitzvot actually are. But it's a beautiful thing to set an example and say, mitzvot is what's going to help you inherit the land. And here, let me start. Before I pass on uh, the expectation <laughs> to the people who are listening to me, first of all, I'm going to start myself. I'll do whatever mitzvot I can, even those that have to do with the land of Israel, whatever I can already now. What I can do on the east side of the Jordan, I'll start with doing. Before I come to expect of you, I'm going to do it on my own. So putting that aside, I want to get back to your question about not adding or subtracting from the Torah. Now, I think this is a very interesting concept, which actually appears twice in Tvarim. Once in our parsha, after Moshe says, you know, all you need to do is to keep the mitzvot in order to inherit the land. And then he says, okay, so listen, Shema ve'ata Yisrael, Shema el ha'chukim ve'el ha'mishpatim. Okay, you need to listen, etc. You don't add and don't subtract from the mitzvot that I tell you. And it also appears later on in Varim, in the beginning of when Moshe actually starts talking about the specific mitzvot. Now, what I find interesting is that if you just learn Tanakh, you're okay. Because you learn Tanakh, you see the mitzvot, you see people fulfilling the mitzvot, everything's fine. You go on to learn Torah Shabbat, Peh, the oral law, and you're like, whoa, who said not to add to the Torah? Are we not subtracting? I don't think we're subtracting from the Torah, but adding to the Torah, you know, the Tanakh, it, it is long, it is big, it does take time to learn and to understand and to grasp, but it's nothing compared to Shulchan Aruch and Talmud, and Mishnah. And so not only is the question, how do we understand the prohibition to add to the Torah, how do we understand our religious world that added and added and added and added? Yeah, I would even strengthen the question a little more because it seems to be that there's an expectation that we're going to add, or at least the Torah Shabbat Ped, the oral Torah, is going to add. So for example, Kashru, the laws of keeping kosher, or the laws of keeping Shabbat, are not explicit in the text. And so there's an expectation that Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral law, is going to come and add something to that. And so I think that when you compare those two bodies of work, it strengthens the question because there's an expectation that there's going to be additions to the Torah and that humanity is going to be involved in those additions. And then at the same time, what additions are okay or not? And how do we do that and set a boundary to not add? It? And exactly what you're talking about, all these other additions that we have. And so how does that work? Exactly. Now, I'm not even talking about what you're talking about, which are necessary uh, supplements, meaning you have to have a certain kind of parshanut because indeed the Torah doesn't give you all the information. But we're not even just trying to figure out the information or trying to define what is a melech on Shabbos or what is actually a sukkah. How is it supposed to look? I'm talking even more than that. Even after Chachamim tell us what is a Malacha on Shabbos, they come and say, but you know what? Let's add in Mukte. You know what's amazing? When I was, I think, 10, 20 years ago, if you asked a kid why you're not allowed to do something on Shabbos, his immediate reaction would be, but it's Mukte. Now, now I hear kids playing and somebody says to somebody else, Aval zechilul. Okay? So, so if they've gotten this concept that it's a Chilul Shabbat. But, but 10, 20 years ago, everything was mukta. Like the whole world of Shabbos was mukta. And mukta is only at the Rabbanan. Musa is something that Chachamim added. And they know that they added on. They said, you know what? We're a little bit worried about you coming to do a malacha. So let's keep you away from that. But that's also something that the Torah hints at. It hints at the idea of us doing a mishmeret, a, a safeguard of the Torah so that we don't come to transgress it. It does have this concept of vows where a person can take upon himself extra things that he's committed to do. So, so we do have in the Torah some hints of ways that a person can add to the Torah, the person or the nation, etc. But still, we need to try to figure out how does this work with the idea of don't add and don't subtract.
Now, if I ask you the first thing that comes to mind when you say don't doubt is a tour, why not? What's the problem with that? My first reaction is to go to the story of Adam and Chava, that if Adam had actually told Chava about what the commandment had been as opposed to don't touch this, that that hadn't been God's command, then who knows what humanity would have looked like because she wouldn't have been fooled by the snake or at least if Adam had said, let's not touch this because God doesn't want us to eat this, then we might be in a better situation. So that's my first association with the danger of adding things, especially with what you're talking about, this difference between muksa and chilul, when it's not explicit that it was something that was added. Exactly. Okay, well, I think that that's something, and if we're talking about learning Torah, I think that's the most relevant point to our life. But before we address that point, I want to talk about a few other points. I think if I think to myself, when I read this, don't add and don't subtract, the first thing that I actually think about is, you know what, the Torah is perfect. The Torah embodies God's everlasting wisdom. This is a piece of art. This is a work of the mastermind, and you're coming to touch it? I mean, imagine if someone comes in to a museum, okay, he gets to the Louvre and sees the Mona Lisa and says, ah, it's beautiful. I just, you know what? I want to add some lipstick. The mere idea of someone coming and touching this piece of work, touching this amazing, complete, perfect piece of work, is like appalling. It's how can you even think about the idea of touching this? Like this is the first thing that I would say. You know the Torah embodies God's wisdom. Don't touch it. Don't take away. Don't add. I think of, you know, sometimes when we do things and we do a piece of art. You said I was writing a book, okay? I just gave in the, the manuscript. I wrote a book. You know, I thought how much... Mazel tov. Thank you. How much time did I think of every word and every paragraph? and how I'm going to build it, and how I'm going to present it, and what I want to say, but also what I want people to hear, and how I need to present it. And you know, if somebody just came and said, you know what, let's take off this chapter. Now, they might be right, because you know, I'm human, and maybe I didn't think of things all the way, but to think of doing that to God, how dare you? Okay, so that's like my first thought. How dare you touch this piece of work? How dare you touch this thing? Don't add and don't subtract. Erasing a piece and adding a piece are just as bad if you're thinking of a work of art. So, so that's like the first thing. The second thing that I would think is, you know what? Let's look at context. It's interesting to notice that the context in the Torah of where both times it says, don't add and don't subtract, they both come in the context of Avodah Zarah, meaning this certain fear that Moshe has, the Torah has, that when people come to the land of Israel and they're going to be looking around and they're going to say to themselves, you know what, the people here, they're really pious. The people here, they're really devoted. Look how devoted they are. They sacrifice their children. Look how devoted they are. They inflict pain on themselves. Look how devoted they are. They actually are sacrificed to God every place and not only in one place. Such devotion. Let's take that into our world. Let's try to copy that devotion. And that devotion, we know, is bad. <laughs> there are certain ways of worshiping God that are not good and not moral. So we could also say that it's a matter of context. And you know what? If we're thinking about in terms of the ways this meets us in our world, I think that's something that we always need to be worried about because we have a certain kind of low self-esteem, a certain kind of way that we look at ourselves and we're always comparing. We're always checking to see are we pious enough? Are we righteous enough? Are we smart enough? Are we, is our Torah nice enough? Lots of times the reasons we want to accept things into our religion or take things out of our religion is because we feel a certain comparison to the people around us and we don't feel good enough. And Moshe is coming to say, you know what? You're going to meet other cultures. You're going to meet other people. You're going to meet other religions and the way people worship their gods. But we're doing it right. We're doing it. We have the right 
balances and we have enough devotion and God doesn't want us to be sacrificing every place and he definitely doesn't want us sacrificing to other gods and he most definitely doesn't want us sacrificing our children. So if we stick to God's guidelines and stick to the framework that he gave us, we'll be immune against trying to please the world and all the other cultures and what everybody else is trying to teach us that they're better than us. So that I think is the second way I think to understand this command in its context. I thought that second piece of context, especially the way that you parlay it or bring it outside of Avodah Zarah, because especially for us today, that's not necessarily an issue. I don't know very many people that are like, oh no, I can't sacrifice my child. God thinks I'm bad or not good enough. But to be able to bring that into a modern context, I love how you did that. I want to go back to your first piece for a second about the perfection. I'm curious what your thoughts are about how that idea works in connection to the idea that God partners with us in Torah. So what Moshe is doing here is preparing the people for a level of independence. Where is that line in terms of what Chazal do? Where is the line in terms of my own personal observance? Like you mentioned, taking on different vows or different levels of observance personally. How do I know if I'm doing the right thing? And how do I make sure that I'm not tarnishing something It's almost like a coloring book, right? That I'm being told color, but don't mess up. So I'm wondering if you can take us back there. Okay, color, but don't go out of the lines, right? Right. Just like a child. The best way of coloring is not going out of the lines. So let's take all of this together. Meaning, we don't want to tarnish, but God gave it to us. Meaning, even if we think of the Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa is a piece of art, but then you have the frame that's put around it. And then it's put in a certain room with certain lighting, and a certain setting and different people looking at it will see different things and it's in a building and in a country we can have we can keep the work of art perfect and still put it in a setting and still give it a certain framework and still hold on to it and put it in a certain a frame of reference and i think that's part of what moshe rabbeinu is telling us take this piece of work take this work but guard it and the way you guard it and the way you implement it in your life and the place you put it it in your life, that will be dependent on you. That will, how you safeguard it and how you uh, keep it. But then we go back to what you said about Adam and Chava. Many commentators see what happened in the story of Adam and Eve as the first example of what happens when you add to the Torah. Because if we notice, God spoke to Adam and told him, you can eat from whatever you want, just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge between uh, good and wrong. But apparently he passed on this command to the woman who wasn't there at that time and apparently added, you know what, let's just not touch it. Except he didn't say, God told us not to eat and I want us also not to touch to make it easier for us. He said, God told us not to eat and not to touch. And then once she touched it and nothing happened, according to the Midrash, then she said, okay, you know what? We can also eat. Now, this, I think, is something very, very relevant for us and for our students and for our children, because I think lots of times we're not aware enough of the difference between what God gave us and what we decided to add on. So even if we have the authority to add on, we have the legitimacy to come and say, you know what? We're afraid that we're going to transgress what God gave us. We're afraid that we as humans will be inclined to come and see the tree and touch it, and then we'll just eat it. So let's not touch it. But that's okay to say that. It's okay to come and say, we need to understand what our inclinations are and deal with them. Okay, When someone's on a diet, They don't say to themselves, you know what, I'm going to have the house full of chocolates and cheeses and all kinds of uh, muffins and cakes, and I'm just not going to eat. Lots of times they'll say, you know what, I know myself, and if I have these things in the house, I'm going to eat them. So I'm not going to bring them in the house. And that's totally legitimate. But we need to know the difference. Because if we think it's all together, once the muffin is in the house, it's also going to be in my mouth. 
without being able to disconnect these two actions. So if if Chava doesn't know that she's not supposed to eat and she thinks it's all one big transgression, eating, touching, it doesn't matter, then, then she won't know to stop at the right point. So for me, this is a very important message. This is what the Rambam says. The Rambam says, you know, when you transgress the prohibition of adding or taking away from the Torah, you transgress it when you think that what Chazal taught us is the Torah. Meaning you're not transgressing by actually adding, you're transgressing it if you're not aware that it's an addition. Because you can say to yourself, okay, the Torah tells us X and we're adding X plus one, that's okay. But if we think that X plus one is X, that's when we're touching the masterpiece. That's when we're touching this piece of work. That's when we're saying that we're not only partners with God, but we're trying to draw his picture. But not only are we trying to draw his picture and maybe not making it as pretty as it would have been, but we're misunderstanding God's intellect and we can also from there get to doing things wrong. Now, what I love about this Rambam is that he passes a lot of responsibility to the people learning Torah. Because what the Rambam is saying is it's okay. We have the Oraita, we have the Rabbanan, but you have to know the difference. Now to know the difference, you have to learn. To know the difference, you need to know what it says in the Torah. You actually need to know what the Torah says. To know the difference, you need to be able to understand the difference. And it's not difference between Pshad and Drash, but it's difference between when Chazar give us a parshanut of the Tanakh and when Chazar give us a gadir, a fence around the Torah. But that's something you have to learn in order to know. So it gives us a lot of responsibility to learn and it gives us a lot of responsibility to understand what did God want from us and what do we as people demand from ourselves in order to better implement what God told us. That was my first reaction when I'm listening to you talk about the Rambam is how much responsibility the reader, the average person has. And I'm wondering what you would say. I know that you have a different hat that you wear in addition to being somebody that studies and teaches Tanakh, which is the Torah Shabbat Peh and Halachic side of things. And that phrase that we hear both as people who teach Tanakh and also people who learn or teach Halacha is that, well, it's just Chazal, or that's just the Derabanan, or, oh, you know, that's just the Midrash. Perhaps in the quest to educate ourselves to the differences, I think that sometimes we can fall into the trap of dismissing Chazal, whether it be Halachically or it being Midrash and Pshat. And I think that that can sometimes put us into hot water in terms of our halachic observance or Jewish practical observance, but also in the terms of the way that we see Torah. And I'm wondering how you, as somebody who does so much learning and is such an independent thinker, how you would continue to uphold your respect for Chazal in this process. Okay, that's, a, that's an important thing. First of all, I think language does have a very important role here. Meaning that just the Rabbanan is different than saying this is the Rabbanan. Meaning the just is the belittling. It's kind of saying, nah, the Rabbanan isn't important. But the Rabbanan is very important. Chazal, if there wasn't a building and guards around the Mona Lisa, we would not have the Mona Lisa. So if we don't have Chazal guarding the Torah and helping us implement it, then the Torah would have gotten lost. And even though, really, I am both a very loving uh, Torah learner, a Tanakh learner. I, I love Tanakh and I love Pshat. And I'm also very, very committed to Torah and Halacha. And I, I admit, it's not always easy to find the bridge between the two. But I keep on reminding myself two very important things. First of all, those who brought to us the Torah and its meaning are Chazal. Those who decided to pass it down. And what is the meaning of the text? Those were Chazal. Uh, we, we have to have a certain faith in the process that a person came to Hillel and Shammai and he wanted to uh, do the Torah, but he wanted only Torah Shebikhtav without Torah Shebelpeh. And then Hillel taught him Aleph Bet Gimel Dalet, and the next day he taught him Dalet Gimel Aleph Bet. And the person said, but yesterday you taught me otherwise. And Hillel says, but are, do you trust me or don't you trust me? Right? Are you going to trust me? The Torah Shebikhtav has no meaning if you don't have someone you trust who tells you what the Hebrew words mean, 
and how to read the letters and how the sentences are structured. Meaning there's so much extra meaning even when you have a written text. So you have to trust the process. But besides that, I keep on reminding myself that God has brought us back to the land of Israel after 2,000 years of exile in the process that Chachamim have helped us uphold the Torah and keep the Torah and guard the Torah. And that's what brought us back to the land of Israel after so many years. I see this as a certain kind of justification for everything that Chazal have done. But again, Chazal took their responsibility. Their responsibility was help us keep the Torah. Their responsibility was to guard the Torah, to make sure that we can implement it in so many fields of our life. But it's our responsibility to know what Chazal did. And for that, we need to learn a lot of Torah. Now, I know that this is a very high expectation to know what is the Araita and what is the Rabbanan, but I think that that is what the Rambam is expecting of us. Now, I must say, not everyone agrees with the Rambam. Some people say, you know what, Baal is only if you have, instead of four things in the lulav, you have five things in the lulav. So we can look at a very, very minimizing way of understanding this prohibition. But I do want to take from the Rambam this idea that keeping the Torah is not only doing things, but also understanding what we're doing. Not only saying, okay, I'm going to keep halach, I'm going to look at the bottom line, because the bottom line doesn't give us this understanding of what God expects of us and what people have added in order to help us keep what God expects of us. And by that, we're not appreciating this piece of work. We're not appreciating the wisdom of God. We're not understanding that there's a difference between what God gave us and what we've added on to help us guard what God gave us. I think it's really interesting that you've highlighted different people having faith in different things. The faith that we have in God and the perfection of his masterpiece, the faith that Moshe Rabbeinu has in the people, the faith that people have in themselves, the faith that people need to have in the process of learning and trusting. And yet the other piece that stands out so strongly to me is what you said in the piece of understanding. And I think that one of the biggest messages that we see in Tvarim is Moshe telling the people that faith isn't completely blind. Like we were talking about before, we have this historical prologue. God is the one who took you out of Egypt. You know who God is. You've seen with your own eyes what happens to people when they don't listen to God. And so part of our faith comes from understanding, whether that's understanding the process or understanding God as much as we can in what he tells us about himself and the way that he works in the world. But this duality that you've highlighted in what you're saying in this relationship between faith and understanding and with those two elements, knowing what the Torah, being what the Torah is, and all of the processes that go along with it, that ultimately it doesn't need anything else. And ultimately it needs human companionship, but not human editorial and not human fixing, if you will. Yeah, I think that understanding is very, very important. And I'll finish on this note. One of the things that Moshe Rabbeinu teaches us, not here, but previously, me ten kol Hashem nevi'im, the real appreciation of wisdom, the real appreciation of the novelty, both of Shirim and the Havdil of the Torah will only come when everybody is knowledgeable, when people take responsibility over their knowledge, over their spirituality, over their understanding of texts. We don't, Moshe Rabbeinu, he knows he's Moshe Rabbeinu. He wants Kora Hashem Nevi'im. He doesn't want to keep the knowledge to himself. He doesn't want everything to stay there and to be the smartest person. We'll still have the professionals, okay? But that doesn't mean that the professionals have all the knowledge. That means the professionals will help us figure out the little finer details, the nuances. But appreciation of those nuances is what we're expecting of the people. And that's a very high expectation. We want people to learn Torah. And I think that's one of the beautiful things of the Torah is that it doesn't keep all of the information and all of the knowledge in a certain elite group. It says, go out and learn Torah. I'm expecting you to learn. I'm expecting you to know. I'm expecting you to own your religious world. And I'll add a small note. The prohibition to add and to subtract from the Torah is not a prohibition only on men. Also, it's a prohibition on women. So also women need to know the difference between their rights and their rabbanan. 
Also, uh, women need to take ownership over their spiritual world and to learn and to know the differences between what God expects and what we've added uh, in order to help us keep the word of God. It's like you said, it's all about raising that bar. And I want to thank you so much for taking your time to share these ideas with us. So, Adina, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. You too. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Please do one on one and women's Torah learning a small favor by sharing this podcast with family and friends so that we can reach new listeners. You can stream and download these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Matan's website. Don't forget to leave us a five star review in the comments. Please send us any feedback at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Thanks for listening, everyone.